Hello, welcome to our Cogit podcast series and, and this uh, podcast in particular. My name is Anthony Richards and I'm the editorial director of Cogit. The intention of this podcast series is to discuss particular themes and issues of uh, contemporary relevance within terrorism and counterterrorism. And today's theme revolves around attitudes to Muslims in Britain, to Muslim communities in Britain, um, and the potential implications this might have for cross-community conversations and discussions on terrorism and counter-terrorism. Now, I'm delighted to be joined today by Professor Maria Sobolewska. Um, she works on the political integration and representation of ethnic minorities in Britain and on public perceptions of ethnicity, um, as well as also the framing of public opinion of British uh, Muslims. She has very recently published and co-authored with Rob Ford uh, the book on Brexit land, identity, diversity, and the reshaping of British politics, which was published through Cambridge University Press um, just last year. So Maria, a very warm welcome to you and thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure, it's a pleasure. So, um, the first question then, in, in light of the recent publication of your book, um, when you refer to identity politics culture wars, what do you mean by culture wars and how do they manifest themselves? So many people associate uh, this phrase culture war with America in the 1960s and uh, since and a kind of era of Trump uh, fanning these cultures, uh, culture wars up, but actually it is a very old term relating uh, to the conflict um, in 19th century Germany over who gets to educate people. And of course, as we know, education is linked to values. The kinds of values that we hold are very much related to the level of education and the style of education that we um, receive. And this is extremely relevant because one of the main um, kind of premises of the book is that as our societies have become much more educated, so almost half of uh, today's young people go to university, as opposed to 7% in the 1970s, their political values have changed. And so what we are now facing is reshaping our politics that used to be around questions of class and economics into a conversation about values. And one of these values uh, is, of course, ethnic diversity and ethno-religious diversity. How do we accommodate difference? How do we accommodate minorities, such as British Muslims, for example? Excellent. No, thank, thank you very much for that. Um, I mean, so um, in the context of culture wars, uh, where does the potential emergence of jihadist extremism lie in all of this? So there is a lot of research uh, linking radicalization and especially radicalization of native born Muslim, uh, especially young men, to this idea of uh, the kind of contrast that they have between being born in Britain and feeling British and the kind of um, reception that they get from the wider society. So if they feel rejected, they feel there is a lot of discrimination, they feel that they aren't admitted as full members of the polity, they are then turning to those alternative uh, value sets and alternative authorities. Uh, so they abandon the authority of the British state and British values, and they go on to um, espouse quite extremist, as we know, uh, jihadist and Islamic uh, philosophies and values. And I think in a society in which we are increasingly talking about those values um, that are against diversity, we have, um, you know, exposed ourselves to this pattern of radicalization becoming more frequent, I feel. And especially one of the big um, things that we have seen uh, after Brexit, and this is what we're calling Brexit land, right? It's this land after Brexit, after the aftermath of the referendum. What we see is that certain positions that were absolutely relegated to minority political parties and quite extreme political parties have now started uh, to be expressed by mainstream political parties. And what we see over time is that rejection of diversity as a social good 
is definitely becoming extremely linked with partisanship. So we do see that people who maybe would have been a little bit uh, less forthcoming with their views against diversity, a little less forthcoming with rejecting Muslims as, part, as fully part, uh, part of Britain, they are now uh, emboldened to say those things because they can see mainstream politicians saying such things. Yeah, yeah, no, thank you very much. That's, that's very interesting. I, I mean, do you think, you know, this general context that you portrayed there, um, uh, is it a bit of a stress to say that, you know, there are kind of potential origins of jihadist extremism and terrorism that might emanate from this as a factor? So we do think that um, as the conversation about how Britain defines itself, a lot of these conversations have become about uh, ethnic diversity and the place the ethnically different and um, certainly uh, religiously uh, different kind of minorities to the usual Anglo-Saxon, Anglican uh, majority, how they are accommodated has everything to do with how those people will perceive whether they are a part of the British project or whether they think they have to carve out a new identity, a new place for themselves. And of course, if we do think that um, they receive the message they're not part of the British uh, project, they will be then more vulnerable to those messages of, well, maybe the British project is wrong and maybe you have to do something to overthrow uh, the British project. So there is actually a, a very interesting uh, line of research comparing jihadi radicalization to what has happened in Northern Ireland and that kind of feeling of separation um, and segregation of the two religious groups has influenced through this process of othering um, almost the, the line of thinking that it was okay to attack those others because they were uh, on the wrong side of the value divide. They rejected you, so why should you um, be loyal to them? Why should you have a sense of commonality and belonging? Yeah, so thank you. I mean, do you think some of this ties into the literature on suspect communities? Um, so I do think um, this is a double-edged sword, I think, uh, with yeah. those kinds of narratives, right? So I think the more we uh, treat certain communities as suspect, the more we risk uh, alienating them and the more we risk those kinds of narratives, right? But on the yeah. other hand, I also think we have to think and maybe rephrasing it from suspect communities to uh, vulnerable communities is important because, of course, it is very important in a in a uh, today's politics where we feel some people might feel alienated and might feel rejected that we do actually proactively engage with them and reach out to them, right? As you uh, yourself uh, has started this national conversation, it is very important that the conversation includes everybody and it's open to everybody, um, and so yeah. I'm sure you know more about this than I do. No, 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 thank you very much for that. Um, in the contribution that you made to the book, very kindly, uh, on jihadist terror, um, you noted deteriorating public attitudes uh, towards um, uh, Muslims. Um, um, and indeed, I think you suggest that they were the most prejudiced against group in the UK. Um, and you need the uh, sort of, you emphasise, I think, in that chapter as well, the need for uh, research on the social responsibility of media reporting. Um, I'm just wondering if you could perhaps elaborate a little further on how such attitudes towards Muslims might be improved um, in general, and perhaps more particularly, um, in what ways the media can be more socially responsible than its report. Mm. So it is definitely um, one of those extremely uh, difficult problems, right, to improve attitudes towards a certain community. But what we see when we look at attitudes towards various communities of kind of minority religious or minority ethnic origin is that over time they do become more positive. And I think that is the familiarity effect, right, that uh, we see growing intermarriage, um, intermingling of communities. And we do see that those communities that might have initially in the 1950s or 60s uh, been thought of as threatening are no longer threatening because new generations are growing up with that diversity. And this really singles Muslims out because this is the only group that has seen a deterioration in those attitudes instead of this kind of progressive uh, liberalization. And I think um, it's almost magnifies the effect of 
um, what I spoke about before, this othering, that not only uh, are British Muslims feeling under pressure, but also in contrast with other ethnic and religious groups, they are the most under pressure. Um, and like um, this has been already observed before Brexit, but as I optimistically called in that chapter, I felt that this could be changed by uh, trying to influence the media narratives around that. But I must say I am less optimistic now about whether we can even uh, talk about media responsibility when in fact we have politicians who don't take that responsibility. And again, as I said before, the mainstream politicians now, rather than the extremist politicians, who are saying openly very Islamophobic things. And of course, the media will take uh, their cues from politicians. Um, and I, in the book, actually, and this is, I think, very relevant to this problem, um, we discussed the case of Scotland as a nation that has managed to move towards becoming more nationalistic. So you'd think that's a you know ethnocentric attitude, but actually they have created this sense of Scottishness open to all. And in fact, we don't see such strong correlation between um, having voted, for example, for Scottish independence and disliking immigrants and disliking Muslims. So there is a way in which politicians can change those narratives and become more inclusive. Um, but yeah, I would, in contrast to what I said in the chapter, I think I'd start with politicians now rather than the media. Yes, and I, I guess you're suggesting that this is a reflection of the more polarised environment we live in, perhaps these days in that sense. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I guess the, the problem with polarisation is that it offers a very strong uh, incentive for politicians to lean into those attitudes. In polarised debates, the middle ground, even if that middle ground is actually the majority of our population, it gets silenced in a way, and we can only hear the more extreme versions, right? So we see, um, on the one hand, uh, the kinds of narratives that really alienate quite a lot of our population, which are on the kind of progressive left, about how even being anti-immigration can be a racist uh, kind of attitude in itself. And then on the other side of that polarized debate, we have uh, people openly saying very Islamophobic things. And so even though most of us are in the middle, we don't have a voice in that debate anymore. And those extremes are fighting with each other. And then, of course, this is um, a debate that doesn't, that isn't inclusive uh, by definition. Polarization yeah, excludes yeah, yeah. that inclusivity. Yeah. yeah. Do you think, um, Maria, do you think these sort of um, deteriorating attitudes towards Muslims you think, and I kind of, I guess you've implied this already, that that lends itself to um, perhaps people being more willing to buy into more extremist narratives. Do you think that is the case? Yeah, so there is uh, quite a lot of research into radicalization that would argue that this is one of the uh, big predictors of, um, of, of why would an individual uh, radicalize, and especially, as I said, in the kind of native born. Uh, people already born in this country who would have assumed um, that they would have the entitlement to be treated equally and uh, be considered a full member of, of the British society. And through the process of growing up in a society that does in fact reject them, they do develop this kind of relative um, gap between their expectations and the reality. Yeah. And we see actually that on a much smaller scale amongst a lot of minorities in this country. And that normally means that they are more likely to vote Labour, for example. Um, and, you know, it has, they are much more likely to uh, engage in non-electoral politics like protests and boycotts and all sorts of things. So um, for Muslims, because that gap between the expectations of being treated as equal and the reality that they are experiencing is just much larger. So even though the risk is still, of course, quite small in terms of numbers of those who will be radicalized, the, this risk is much greater. Yeah, yeah. I mean, do you think this also has an impact on um, cooperation against terrorism within Muslim communities as well? Do you think this makes cooperation more difficult? I think so. I mean, um, the best that we can do against terrorism. And again, uh, you have much better uh, specialists on actual prevention of terrorism in your on your uh, COGIT team. But generally speaking, there is a lot of um, need for buy-in from those communities. 
And of course, if the community feels um, alienated and rejected, that buy-in will be uh, much smaller. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you think, um, I mean, in your chapter, um, you also raised perhaps a concern about leadership within Muslim communities um, and how perhaps Muslims are represented, represented effectively by the leadership. Would you, do, would you like to sort of elaborate a little bit further on that, especially in the context of the conversation we just had about polarization and, and, and who's doing the talking? Is there a silent majority? I, I mean, how how's, does this manifest itself in any way within Muslim communities and the leadership issue there? Yes, so um, this has been an idea that has been documented in Britain for quite a while that a lot of um, claim to represent Muslims uh, were kind of issued by organizations that were either linked uh, with specific um, organizations that were quite religious. And of course, um, uh, there were issues with, you know, how extremely religious they were and how traditionalist they were. But also we had the umbrella body um, that was uh, aiming to overturn this problem and improve the situation. But actually um, the kind of uh, the link between that umbrella body, the Muslim Council of Britain, and the on the ground engagement of British Muslims with those organizations um, has, hasn't been perfect, right? So when we, um, and we very rarely have polls of British Muslims nowadays because of the, um, the cost and the kind of perceived lack of interest in this area as a, as a research area anymore. Uh, but the truth is that what we have from data would suggest that not only um, are Muslims not really engaging with those kinds of, and the, they don't recognize those representatives often, but also ever since the austerity agenda, we have actually seen a shrinking number of civic organizations that could have represented and would have improved the representation of Muslims, right? So we replaced um, a, a funding structure that actually funded those organizations on the local level uh, quite efficiently uh, to this um, disembodied big society that, you know, doesn't provide state funding for those uh, particular organizations. And so we have seen uh, the shrinking of the civil society in some of these areas. Yeah, yeah thank you. I, I suppose the final question, and, and it's looking ahead, um, do you see that, uh, you, you, you said you sort of, you went from optimistic, pessimistic since publication of the chapter, do you foresee a scenario in the future in a post-Brexit UK, where some of these issues to do with uh, attitude can be improved, and, and, and do you see any room for optimism, perhaps once the dust, set, dust settles after Brexit? Yes, I do think, first of all, I mean, one of the um, kind of characteristics of identity politics is that they are relatively short-lived. So one of the uh, big reasons why they are short-lived is because they are only getting activated around specific issues. And of course, immigration has been that specific issue from about mid 2000s in Britain. And that issue has reached a certain culmination with Brexit. And even though the kind of fallout of the referendum has been negative in a sense that those polarizing narratives became mainstream and dominated our politics, they are likely to fizzle out, uh, I think. And of course, when we think about attitudinal change, we think about long-term generational change. And here I am optimistic in a sense that our young people are less prejudiced against uh, people who are, who, who their grandfathers and grandmothers would have construed as others. And even here in Manchester, my children certainly go to very diverse schools and have a lot of positive contact with Muslim communities. And that is the answer. Great. Well, Maria, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you very much for sharing your thoughts and your expertise. It's very interesting indeed. Thanks again very much. And thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure.